Alright. And let me get this. We have to do a little bit of getting ready. The first thing, remember now, Jesus is on his third trip now around Galilee. Third trip. And uh, we call this one the year of disclosure. This is the year that he's going to begin to teach his disciples that he's going to Jerusalem to die. He's going to spend about a whole year on this one subject. Because it's going to be, when we see this today, it's near the Passover. He's going to go through a whole other Passover before he actually gets down there to die for us. So in a year, he says to these fellows, I'm going to die for your sins. I'm going to die for your sins. I'm going to die for your sins. When I get to Jerusalem, the time comes, he gets to Jerusalem. He says to them on the night before he dies, tomorrow they're going to crucify me. The day comes and everybody says, gee, how come we didn't know about this? <laughs> you know, here's somebody who did know. John the Baptist, though. If you go to Mark chapter 6, verse 14 through 29, you see the story there. Herod, as you know, had imprisoned. John's been in prison for a while. When we first started with the ministry of Jesus uh, about two years ago, a year into Christ's ministry, John got arrested. So he's been in jail a long time, about a year now, maybe even a year and a half. Herod, we're told in Mark's gospel that Herod would come to John or have John brought to him and ask him a lot of questions. He really enjoyed his time with John. That's probably why he kept him there so long. Herod's problem was Herod married his wife's, uh, or rather his brother's wife. He had a brother named Philip. And he had this wife named Herodias. And Herod here says, geez, you're kind of a cutie pie. So he marries her. Sort of outranks his brother, marries her. John came and said, you can't do that. It's not right to marry your sister-in-law. Just looks bad. Just, God says you can't do it, you can't do it. So Herod said, well, tell you what I can do. I can put you in jail for saying that. Now Herodias, his wife and Philip's wife, she wants to kill him for saying that. Oh, what well, do you think? I have some kind of a floozy or something? Yeah. <laughs> she wants him dead. For a year, though, Herod's been protecting him from her, and I think maybe that's another reason why he's in prison so long, is protecting him from the queen. But one day, Herod's birthday comes around, or at least the time we're told that they're going to celebrate Herod's birth. And so his birth comes, and his daughter-in-law, or half-daughter, whatever she might be to him, she dances. She's Herodias's daughter, so Philip, this is his niece, who is now sort of a half-daughter to him, right? Her stepdaughter. But it's really his niece. She dances. Some people say it was the dance of the seven veils. Uh, Hedy Lamar does it in the movie. And he is so enamored with it. He says to her, tell you what, I'll give you anything you want to the half of my kingdom. She says, well, you can keep your kingdom. Mom said for me to ask for John the Baptist's head. So she goes, and he says this in front of everybody. He's got all of the rulers, all of the nobles, all of the wealthy people in town. And in front of everybody, he says, I'll give you anything. She says, anything, anything you ask. Promise, promise, scout's on her. She comes back, confers with her mom, and comes back and says, all right, then give me the head of John the Baptist. Are you sure? Yeah. He didn't like the idea, but because he had made a promise, we're told, he had to keep it. And so John, the man is sent, you can see the sword there, and takes John's head, puts it in a charger, or on a plate is what that is, takes it on a plate, takes it to the damsel and to her mother and says, here you go. Rather gruesome by our standard. But that's how John met it. That's how he met his death. And, uh, you know, Jesus would say of him that there, if he already did, we saw that last week when Jesus, when John was sort of doubt, we say he doubted. Uh, he said, Lord, do, are you the one we've been waiting for or do we look for somebody else? Remember that? And Jesus said, go tell John the miracles you've seen. 
the dead are raised, the poor have this, the gospel is preached. And so they go back and basically says to John, wait till you see what he's doing. He's doing everything that the Bible said he would do in the Old Testament. He's doing it all. There isn't a scripture that he isn't fulfilling. John's happy with that and gets the news and about that time they're here to take off his head. It's sort of sad when Jesus began his ministry, John was taken out of the picture. And as he continues his ministry now, getting into this year of disclosure when he's talking about his death, it opens with the death scene again of John the Baptist. Now John's about six months older than Jesus. They're cousins. They knew each other quite well. Uh, his mother Mary had a cousin named Elizabeth. You met her. She's all important come Christmas time. We tell the story so often. So you can imagine, this hurt Jesus. It hurt him when his cousin was placed in prison. And it had to hurt him when he found out that he was slain. And why? Because John believed what Jesus said. He believed that Jesus was the Christ, just like he said he was. He believed that. He believed the same thing that you and I believe, that Jesus Christ is a virgin-born Son of God, that he was going to go to the cross and he was going to die for our sins. He hadn't seen it yet, but John's believing because he knew that's what the Messiah would do, according to the book of Isaiah. But as we continue through, we come to the feeding of the 5,000 in John chapter 6. If you go to John chapter 6, he feeds 5,000. I've got a video on this, and it might be a little bit easier for you to see this. And so if you'll excuse me just a second, I'm going to show that one to you down here. Uh, feeding of the multitude. It's going in a circle, so it must be doing something. Here it goes. Let me make it bigger. Is my thing, my volume on back there? It was on there. I lost my sound. God will 
you hunger for righteousness, you will be filled through me. He said to ask, and it will be given. <laughs> That's another scene. All right. Feeding of the 5,000 is one of the two. There's the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000, which we'll get to next week. These two miracles are probably the most talked about, other than the raising of Lazarus himself. Are two key responsibilities or key responses that Jesus gets. In fact, at the end of the feeding of these 5,000, Everybody wants to make him king. And he says, you don't get it. It's not about what we eat and what we drink. But it's about our service to him. He, say, he will say, you want me to be king because you have eaten the fish. You have eaten the bread. What can you imagine? Now remember, the Jews did not like the Romans. And what they wanted to do was to get the Romans out of their country. But how do you fight a world power when you're just a small country? Can imagine now if you have a king, a commander, when the, one of the basic Roman tactics was to surround your city and to starve you out. They're going to do that in 70 AD. They're going to do that very thing to Jerusalem. They're going to surround Jerusalem. They're going to starve the Jews out. Then they're going to go in and completely demolish the temple, the walls, everything is gone. But now you have a leader who only needs a few fish and a few small crusts of bread and he could feed you. They wouldn't be able to starve you out because your food supply would never end. Your water supply would never run dry. If you were wounded in battle, he could heal you. We saw him heal the blind. We saw him restore the paralyzed man. We even saw him raise the dead. You can imagine what they're thinking and why they want Jesus to be king now. They hate the Romans. Here's a man who could feed them, heal them, lead them. This is a great guy to have as our king. But Jesus didn't want them to want him for a king that way. They wanted people who would serve him. But here's often our own fault. When we think of Jesus, we think of what Jesus can do for us. How can God serve me today? Lord, would you feed me? Now, please, I'm hungry. Bring me my food. Much like a master who would sit at his table and say to his servant, Oh boy, would you bring me some food? Uh, where's my dessert? I'm sorry, my glass is almost empty. Like when you go to Denny's and you say to the waitress, I need more coffee. I need more of this. Uh, do you have any ketchup? Can I get some butter, please? We treat God so often the same way we treat the waiter or the waitress in a restaurant. And that's exactly how these people wanted Jesus. Wow, this man could feed me. This man can clothe me. This man can heal me. Oh, doctor, I have a problem. This Jesus, who could do everything for them, and they saw that. Did they want to worship him? No. Did they want to serve him? No. But they saw how he could serve them. And one of the great sins of our own life, is how we so often look for how God can serve us. He went to the cross and died for us. Should we not be grateful just for that? 
But here is the irony. God can do so much. And God says, I want to do this for you. But still. See, we get a little, we call that, if you have children and they treat their parents like that, we would say they're spoiled. Right? You know, there's a fine line between giving to our children and spoiling our kids. There's a fine line between them coming and asking and them just expecting. And sometimes we don't even bother to ask anymore. We just complain when we don't get. Jesus said that the potter has the power over the clay. He sent one of his prophets to go to the potter's house. And as he was standing there at the potter's house, as he's looking in, he noticed that the potter dropped the clay off of the wheel. He was making a beautiful vessel, beautiful vase. And all of a sudden, clumsy old guy, he knocks it on the floor and it's just a big lump again. So he picks it up. He doesn't try to create the same vase. He's a little upset, so he begins to make that pot into something else. Instead of a beautiful vase, I'll just make it into this ugly plant box out here. Let it go out there in the wind instead of having a place of desire in the house, right? And suddenly Jesus nudges, or rather the father uh, nudges the prophet and says to him, don't you think I should be like that? Did you notice that that clay did not complain to the potter? When at first he began to make something beautiful, and then he changed his mind and made something more useful out of it. Did you hear the clay complain to the potter? No, the prophet said. And God says to the prophet, I wish I had me some people like that. I wish I had me some people that I could get into their lives and make them what I need. We are so busy asking God to answer our prayers, we often forget to be the answer to his prayer. How often we get up in the morning and say, Lord, I need, instead of, Lord, what would you like for me to do today? How can I serve you today? It's always, Lord, I'm awake now. Would you please get busy doing things for me? And we treat him more of a slave. He fed 5,000 people. And they said, wow, this man would serve us well. Nobody said we should serve this man. Nobody said only God could do these kind of things. We ought to be his slaves. Instead, let's make him king. And, and here's the irony of the whole thing. Let's make him king so he can serve us. When you think of a king, do you think of a servant? No. When we think, let's make him our king so we can serve him. But do you see the crowd? Let's make him king so he can serve us. Do you think any other king other than God gets treated that way? Do you think any God other than uh, any king other than God would put up with that? It's a good thing he remembers we're just dust. That's what he said. I remember your but dust. And I say thank you, Lord. Because us dusty old people sometimes, we get in the way. We do dusty stuff. And God says, well, I know that. But we try and get our minds to think properly. We try to remind ourselves that he's the king, Lord of lords. When we read the book of Revelation in the morning when we're going through it today, what does all heaven do? Hmm? First word out of their mouth, amen. I agree with whatever God's about to say. I agree with whatever God is saying now. And I'm going to agree with whatever God says tomorrow. Amen. Two words we learned this morning in the heavenly language. Amen and hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The four and twenty elders who surround the throne, the four beasts and all the angels of heaven, 
fall on their faces before God and sing glory to God. And we say, oh, when you're done with that worship, would you come down here and serve me? I bet folks in heaven just want to slap us sometimes because of the way we treat their king, because he hasn't yet become our king. He's our savior, but he hasn't yet progressed sometimes in our lives to be in the king, the Lord that he ought to be. We don't see him like the prophet did, high and lifted up. We see him like these people. He's dressed like them. He looks like them. He sounds like them. The only difference is he can serve them. He's got that power. But the strange thing is that power is what should make us want to serve him instead. But we don't often think that way. We don't often think that way. Mikey, would you click me back to the year of disclosure right here so I can click the next one? Yeah. All right. So we saw him feed 5,000. A little boy brought his lunch that day. You know we're not told that boy's name? Wouldn't it be interesting, though, to meet him in heaven? One of the largest miracles just flat out for pure size, 5,000. His next one is only going to feed 4,000. But he feeds 5,000 people. And we're told with just two fishes and uh, three barley loaves, I think it was, or five. Barley is, is, barley is what poor people eat. Barley is what they fed the horses. Barley is what they fed the mules. Barley is what they fed the donkeys. Wheat was what people ate. Poor people, though, that couldn't afford wheat ate barley. So we know this much about that boy. He was poor. Did you hear anybody complain when they ate a poor man's lunch? No. Somebody leaned over to me and said, that must have been the first sushi. <laughs> maybe it was dried cooked fish. I don't know. Maybe Jesus broiled it as he had. I couldn't eat fish anyway, let alone if it's raw like that. I mean, it just, come on. I'm glad when I get to heaven, I don't have to put up with that stuff. Right? But you can imagine. Everybody ate what this little boy brought. Nobody else. Look at all the adults around. 5,000. We're told that it's 5,000 men. Let alone women and children. Just men alone, 5,000. If those men had a wife, you got 10,000. If they had just one child, that's 15,000. All of a sudden, there's a lot of people on that hillside. And a lot of people eating one boy's lunch. You know the look on his face when he watched his lunch feed everybody? That'd be like you going down to McDonald's and getting a Happy Meal and then feeding everybody you saw, 5,000 people, Reach in and get a burger and hand it out. Reach in and get a burger and hand it out. Oh, and some fries. Can't have a burger without no fries. And a small drink. And it never runs. Well, I tell you, I'd be a happy camper. If I can get me a happy meal and it lasts forever like that, I'm okay. One happy meal, that's it. The rest of, of course, probably tomorrow I'd complain at God because I'm eating happy meal three times a day. <laughs> this little boy. And what a surprise when he watched them bring back, because we're told that there was 12 baskets of food left over, one for each of the apostles. Because you know that they weren't really all that believing at first. When they came and said, Lord, you have to send all these people away because we're in a desert place and there's no food for them. And Jesus said, you feed them then. And Philip who wants to help and says, Lord, I looked into the treasury and we got like 200 pennies. Two bucks. Two bucks does not buy that much bread. Now, when I was a child, I remember my mother went to McCoy's Market and for a dollar we could get 12 loaves of bread. Oh, probably wasn't the best bread in all the world, but 12 loaves of bread for a dollar. Two bucks we could get 24 loaves. That would feed some people, but it's not going to feed 5,000. And that's why he said, but even with that, what is that among so many? 
24 loaves of bread, even if we gave everybody one slice, we're going to run out pretty quick. Probably 20 slices in a bag. So, okay, we might be able to get to a couple of hundred people and then everybody's going to shoot us. Somewhere around 460 after that, no more food. You're talking 5,000. Two small fish. Nasty little fish, too. And five barley, not wheat, barley loaves. Barley loaves. But them folks were so hungry when it came, mm, mm, mm. They ate it all up. And then they bring all that food back and that boy's just looking. You know, I wonder if his mom and dad was there on that hillside. Or if maybe he woke up that morning and he saw streams of people walking past his house. And he probably thought the circus was in town. He probably thought it was a big parade. So he runs outside, sees all the people, runs back in. Mama, mama. And she fixes him a lunch real quick. Go in the refrigerator. Get them old fish from yesterday. There's a couple of loaves of bread up there in that jar. And he grabs them real quick, puts them in the lunch, and off he goes. I wonder how big a spanking he got when he got home, when he told his mama a whopper about how he fed five. What did you, you, you do today, son? Oh, I fed 5,000 people. With what? With that lunch you packed for me, mom. <laughs> you know, nowadays I, I don't suppose you can spank kids anymore. But in my day, back when I was a young one, boy, my mama's hand was always coming down like that, right? And if you told a big one, boy, let me tell you, you got even worse. No, honest mom, honest mom. This man took my bread and handed it all out. What would you give your bread to strangers for? Because he asked for it. Don't talk to strangers. That poor little guy probably got beat silly when he got home. But you think he ever forgot what he saw? Uh -uh. See, we don't often think about that little boy. He was a real person, lived in a real time. Had real parents who probably had a real response to this. Now, if they were there and they knew what happened, that's one thing. But Philip only says, hey, I found a little boy here. He didn't say I found a family. Didn't say I got a mom and a dad who have. He said, I found a little boy and he's got a lunch. What's he got? Uh, two small fish and five barley loaves. But what is that among all these people, Lord? See, even while Philip is talking to Jesus and wanting to be helpful, his lack of faith, he couldn't help it. It came out of him. Because sometimes we look at what God could do if he wanted to. We look at the problem that God's looking at that too. Did you notice that Jesus was looking at the same 5,000 people that the arrested disciples were looking at? He saw them too. Jesus, in fact, was the one who said he saw the people. He saw the multitude and he had compassion on them. So he says to the disciples, what are we going to do about this? Well, we could send them home. Jesus said, no, no, no. Why don't you all feed them? See, Jesus sees the problem before you ever do. And we're told he knew what he was going to do, but he was testing Philip when he said to Philip, how much money do you have to feed these people? He knew all along what he was going to do. But he tested Philip by asking Philip that question. And every now and then a question will come into your heart as you look at your problem. And God's just testing you. He already knows what he's going to do. But he's letting you be tested. He asked you the question to test you. He himself, we're told, already knew what he was going to do. Huge miracle. In fact, this miracle he's going to use, he's going to remind his disciples later when he's about to give his life. And he'll say to them, do you remember when we fed the 5,000? Do you remember when we fed the 4,000? Oh, yeah, yeah. How much did you do and how much did I do then? Well, as I recall, you pretty much did everything. Yeah. And from time to time, we have to remember that in the feeding of the 5,000, here's the question, how much did you do? You didn't do anything. 
Did the miracle still happen? Yeah, because he did it all. And that's what he wanted the disciples to learn. Yes, I can do this kind of stuff. I can feed people even in the desert. Next one comes out and he's walking on the water. And that's found for you here in Matthew chapter 14. See, after he fed the 5,000, he said to his disciples, you go across the lake, I'll meet you on the other side. He goes up in a mountain to pray. The disciples begin to go across the Sea of Galilee. They get somewhere out there in the middle of it, and suddenly this huge storm. Storms can come without warning on the Sea of Galilee because it, it's like kind of down in a fishbowl. And that wind just comes running down those hills, and the next thing you know, it's a big storm. He's not there. Remember last week when we were together, Jesus was on, in the back of the boat sleeping. This time, he's not in the boat. Because, la see, last week, they were scared. They thought they were going to sink. Remember, the waves were coming into the boat. They woke Jesus up, and they say, don't you even care that we're about to die? And Jesus like, I'm laying right here. I'm laying right here. He says, peace, be still. And suddenly the waves stop and the ocean, or rather the lake, became calm. The Sea of Galilee, like glass, when he spoke. Now, it's only been a short while, a couple of days since that's taken place. So don't you suppose these guys would remember that? So it wouldn't be much of a test, right, to go back out on that very same sea and to have those very same waves kick back up again. They'd say, oh, well, don't even wake him up, fellas. We were through this last week, and he'll handle it. So to test them this time, guess what? He doesn't get on the boat. They get in the boat. They go off to the other side. He says, I'll meet you over there. You guys take off. I wonder who thought in the back of their head, well, how is he going to get here then? Well, there's a lot of boats in the village, I'm sure. Somebody will row him on over there. He asked us to go, so let's go, fellas. They get in the middle of it, and before you know it, the skies are dark, the wind is howling, and their poor boat is just about to sink again. Suddenly... I like the way Mark says it. Because in Mark, they say, it's a ghost. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, as they're about to drown, they see someone walking on the water. Now, if you're, let me tell you, I've been out on the ocean. I'm an old sailor from way back. And if I had seen me someone walking on the ocean, it would have scared me too. I've been out there where the waves, my ship was over 70 some odd feet and those waves would be taller than that. I mean, from the bottom of my boat to the top of that stack, huge. We had like 20 something decks on this thing. It was a massive ship. And yet sometimes we'd look out there and the waves would be way up there, hundreds of feet high. And we would go down into this bowl and then we would come up and we'd be like on a mountaintop and the rudders of our ship are turning loose and vibrating the whole ship like crazy because they're not in the water and then we'd sink back down there again. I mean, it was huge. You're talking a lot of swing. You're down this valley thinking that if that just caves in, I'm dead. Next thing you know, you're way up at the top and you think if this thing doesn't stop ruddering, like we're all going to just shake apart and it just kept dropping you up and down. Sometimes you'd see ships out there and the next thing you didn't see anything out there. And if somebody had come walking on those waves, hey guys, 